your faith can move the mountains Let the mountains move We come with expectation Waiting here for you Waiting here for you You're the Lord of all creation And see you know my heart The author of salvation Your love it from the start Waiting here for you High in praise, and it's you we adore, singing We're desperate for your presence All we need is you Waiting here for you With our hands lifted high Psalm for giving thanks. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Hallelujah. Your ear to heaven and hear 
the noise inside the sound of angels of the sound of angels song and all this for a king we could join and sing all to Christ the King How gunst and how divine The song of us will rise How gunst and how divine His love of us will rise Will rise Who will praise Him Praise the joyous noise, the sound of salvation come, the sound of rescue ones, and all this for a king. Angels join to sing, all for Christ the King, how infinite and sweet. Love's a rescuing Oh, how infinite and sweet This great love that has redeemed As one we sing Hallelujah Hallelujah Union Church. Please be seated. I just welcome you all to Union Church this morning. Do we have any visitors? I don't... Any first-time visitors? Oh, let me take my mask off. But Union Church is a, a Bible-based, disciple-making, church-planning church, and we welcome all. I'm glad you're here today. I see our numbers are down a little bit. I think people, maybe they're staying home because of this COVID that won't leave us alone. And uh, we, we just have to remain vigilant about this virus. You know, practicing the same stuff, of washing hands, with ma wearing masks, social distancing, getting vaccines, because I understand the government might make uh, uh, vi vaccine manda uh, mandate for all public places, restaurants and hotels, churches. Uh, so we'll see what happens. But, you know, we, we try to take care of everybody here. We clean the sanctuary very well. And today we're going to have the treats up on the grass so there's a lot more space. So just maintain your distance while you have your fellowship. All right. Small groups are still in uh, hold. There's a lot of people still traveling. Uh, but we'll get them going again. And as soon as uh, we have dates, we'll let you know. And just to give you an update on the construction, we've completed uh, Pastor Craig's new office, which is in the same place where his old office was. But now we just made better use of that whole area. So Pastor Craig and Franza will each have nice offices, and there'll be a room for the children, and there'll be another room for uh, Bible studies and uh, meetings, and it'll have soundproof walls now and no interruptions if you're having a, a meeting. So it'll be much uh, uh, better than it was. Uh, 
we have an update from Sam. Everybody was a little worried if he was going to get home with all the canceled flights and all, but he did get back. I'll read you his, uh, his uh, message that he just sent. I believe it was yesterday. I made it safely to Kansas and am visiting with my mom and sister. On January 18th, which is Tuesday, I will be traveling to Minneapolis, Minnesota to the REACH Global Headquarters. Please continue to keep me in your prayers as I go through the change of status process with REACH Global. So what he's doing, he's, he, uh, he's worked for a couple of years with REACH Global on a, kind of a probationary period. A lot of us have sent in evaluations of him, and now he has to sit down with the leaders of REACH Global and go through some uh, interviews, uh, which I don't see any problem with. So uh, when he comes by, back, he'll be a, a dedicated uh, missionary. Uh, Sam's received the call, and he's answered it with an uh, open heart, which is wonderful. So let's keep him in our prayers. Uh, and there's no other announcements today. So let's uh, stand and continue to uh, praise the Lord through our music. Set free. 
lives in us, lives in
Thank you, Jesus, and thank you, worship team. Uh, very inspiring, and we have uh, wonderful music here at Union Church. So uh, I'd just like to give these three uh, artists a nice round of applause. <laughs> well, good morning once again. As always, it's a blessing to be here and be able to teach on the Word of God. Once more, I'm Pastor George. Pastor Craig has returned to Rio, if his flight's on time, this morning, and he's probably on his way from the airport right now to his home. So let's just give thanks for uh, God hearing our prayers and letting him experience a wonderful vacation with his family and uh, returning safely. If I told you to pull out a piece of paper and write on it who you say Jesus is, what would you write? We all have some answers. We all have some images of Jesus. Some of them are images we learned as children in Sunday school, or maybe from a youth group, or maybe from a Bible study, or maybe from reading your Bible, or maybe what other people have told us. Some answers conflict, some become meaningless, some result in confusion. Some of us have never really examined the evidence for ourselves to really answer the question, who do you say Jesus is? One of my main goals in preaching is to gain a, a fresh hearing for Jesus, especially among those who believe they already understand him. I'm sorry to tell you this, but you probably don't understand him as well as you think. Because what happens sometimes is that presumed understanding leads to misunderstanding. Jesus sometimes is obstructed by clouds of well-intentioned misinformation. But ultimately, rather than give you my answer to the question, I'd rather challenge you to answer the question for yourself, because that's the only answer that really matters, your answer. Is he the Messiah, the Son of God? If that's what you think, what does that mean? Jesus clearly didn't fit into what a Messiah was supposed to, to be. Messiahs were supposed to have power. They, they were supposed to take charge. We were supposed to set things right and free the Jews from political bondage. But Jesus refused to stiff arm anybody. He refused to dominate or to take up arms. Is he the Savior? Yeah, okay. But what is he saving us from and what is he saving us to? Some people clearly had no interest in being saved. Is he a teacher? Surely. But is that all? So who do you say he is? The Son of God? Messiah? Savior? Lord? Shaman? Teacher? Friend? Prophet? Prince of Peace? Now, as you try and answer that question, don't be too alarmed if you can't nail it down. Even those of us who wrestle with this question regularly find it difficult because Jesus is sometimes downright incomprehensible. He is often enigmatic, ambiguous. From the very beginning, who Jesus was what he was all about was far from self-evident. There were people who stood face to face with Jesus and said, this is God incarnate. There appeared to be many more who said, this man is nuts. Although I think that for most of us, the biggest issue isn't what we've listened to, isn't that we've listened to Jesus and found him incomprehensible. I think it's that we haven't listened to him enough to fully and positively answer the question. Today, I want to continue with the same theme from last week, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So there'll be a little bit of repetition, but this stuff is worth repeating. In the Gospel of John, John wants to lead you to, the, to answer this question, who do you say I am? The question is so important that the Apostle John uses his entire Gospel to show the reader the proper answer. Let me read you his purpose of his Gospel in chapter 20. Verses 30 and 31. John 20, 30 and 31. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. 
But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by, by believing, you may have life in his name. John is very selective in what he includes in his gospel. But first of all, what is the definition of a gospel? Literally, it's good news. John and the other writers of the gospel, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all are bringing a message to us, and it is a message of good news, the stories of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The gospel is more than just a message of good news. It also symbolizes victory, the victory of Jesus over sin and death, which is proven by his resurrection, ascension, and session at God's right hand. These stories or signs that John relates are not parables, but actual events that took place in Jesus' life. A parable is literally something cast alongside, something else. Jesus' parables were stories that were cast alongside a truth in order to illustrate the truth. His parables were teaching aids and can be thought of as inspired comparisons. A common description of a parable is that it is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. But John's stories are actual events that took place in Jesus' life. The Gospel in John includes seven miracles. John calls them signs to demonstrate the deity of Christ and illustrate his ministry. The signs were performed as a testimony to the identity of Jesus, which would result in a belief and a worship of him. These signs that Jesus performed convinced many that he was the Messiah, the Son of God, and they continue to achieve that same purpose for us today. Look what John is telling us that there are many stories or signs that he has not written down to include in his gospel. But what he has included is sufficient for us to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and by believing this have eternal life. John was selective and what he included in his gospel is sufficient for us to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. So John leaves his reader, you and me, with no question concerning his motive for writing the gospel that bears his name. He sought to convince us that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. When a writer of Scripture specifically states his purpose, we must all pay attention so that we can understand his primary and controlling objective. John encourages us to do something more than just give intellectual consent to the truth that Jesus Christ is uniquely the Son of God. He sought to persuade us to make Jesus Christ the Lord of our lives. John was vitally concerned that those who read his gospel come to experience life in its finest form and its richest quality. Let me read you another passage from the Gospel of John. Chapter 1, verses 35 to 50. So please stand with me as I read these verses. John 1, 35 to 50. They'll also be posted up on the overhead, and I believe they're included in your uh, bulletin. The next day, John w was there again. That's John the Baptist. Was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher. Where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went with him and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. 
When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. This is the word of God. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together this morning to give praise to you and to better understand your message to us. Let us receive your message with humble and contrite hearts so that we may truly understand that your Son, Jesus Christ, is the Son of God and experience his fullness and life eternal. In his name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. It's interesting to note that one of the disciples receiving this invitation in verse 39 is never named. Many people say that this unnamed person represents us, John's readers, who, like the named disciples in this passage, are invited to see for themselves how the divine may surprise us, transform us, and up in the prejudices with which we expect to encounter God in the world. God seeks us. We don't seek God. But we must respond to his calling, just as his apostles did, by believing and following Jesus. Here, Jesus is just getting started. He ends these verses we read by stating, you will see greater things than that. He is just getting started. And the Paul's purpose here is to tell us these greater things in order to convince us that Jesus is truly the Son of God. Some say that the law of self-preservation is the first law of nature. And this not only includes us, but all animals and plants. We all want to survive. We all want to live. John appeals to this motive in his presentation of the gospel. He affirms that God the Father is vitally interested in our eternal preservation. Just look at the well-known verse of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Have what? To have eternal life. He wants us to have much more than just the here and now. He wants us to have eternal life. We as Christians are travelers, but not travelers on the road to death, but travelers on the road to eternal life. Believers are not on the road to death, but to eternal abundant life. John was eager to share the good news so that people could come to know Jesus Christ, who he truly was. John, the beloved apostle, was truly an evangelist. John selected seven great signs or miracles under the guidance of the Holy Spirit to convince the minds and hearts of people that Jesus Christ is indeed the Son of God and worthy of all confidence that we can place in him. Of this, all the stories of Jesus' life, John only includes these seven. Seven that are familiar to most of us, some of them in detail. They are changing water into wine, healing an official son, healing a lame man, feeding the 5,000, walking on water, healing the man born blind, and rising Lazarus from the dead. We don't have time to look at each one of these signs, so let's just look at a few of them. Last week we looked at detail from the book of Matthew on the sign of walking on water, where Jesus demonstrated his divine authority and power, his divine knowledge, divine care, and divine love. We will see how these other signs and mir or miracles are similar demonstrations of Jesus' divinity. The first one was turning water into wine in John 2. This is, this is Matthew's, or this is Jesus' first miracle. Here we find Jesus attending a, a wedding at a simple home in Cana in Galilee. Part of the celebration was to have wine for the guests. To run out of wine was bad, showing disrespect for the guests. But that is what happened. They ran out of wine. So Jesus' mother pointed this fact out to Jesus. He then had the servants 
fill six jars with plain water. Each jar held 95 or 110 liters, which is a lot of water. Times six, that's over 600 liters. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And it was the best wine of the evening. The celebration was saved. No embarrassment. And everyone was happy. In verse 111, John tells us what Jesus had done. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. John says that the sign was to reveal his glory. It had a purpose for the reader, for you and me, to see his glory. What this sign pictured was the normal outcome of the combination of human and divine activity. Men can fill jars with water. Only God can turn that water into wine. Men can do the ordinary, the commonplace, normal activity. But God touches it and brings it to life and gives it flavor, fragrance, and effect. That is the meaning of the sign. It's an indication of what the ministry of Jesus is going to be like whenever he touches a human life. Not only during his lifetime on earth, but also through all the centuries to come, whenever his ministry would be present in the world. Thus it affects us today as well. Bring God into your situation and all the humdrum, commonplace activities are touched with a new power that makes them fragrant, flavorful, enjoyable, and delightful, giving joy and gladness to the heart. This sign also shows us the glory of Jesus. Already in chapter 1, John has told us what the glory of Jesus is. It is grace and truth, the fullness of grace and truth. Here in this event, we see both his grace and truth. Grace by his blessing the married couple with the best wine and saving the celebration. And in this sign comes the truth, which is the glory of Jesus. In that event, there was manifested truth about himself, that he was the Lord of nature. In his book, Miracles, C.S. Lewis has pointed out, that every miracle of Jesus is simply a kind of short-circuiting of a natural process, doing instantly something which in general takes a longer period of time, water to wine. No wonder that the third factor John brings out is his disciples believed in him. They believed that Jesus was here, that Jesus was God's man, ruling over all the works of God's hand. Put, putting dominion and authority over the natural world, doing with it whatever he pleased. That is the sign, the mean, is the meaning of this miracle. When the disciples saw it, they believed. They saw that here was one who could control life. Here was one who could take a commonplace thing, nothing out of the ordinary, simple water, and make it something special, turn it into wine, a source of joy, of glory, and of warmth. Our Lord is able to take the humdrum, commonplace, ordinary, normal events of any life and, and with his touch make it full of flavor, fragrance, strength, and beauty to turn them into wine. He will do this with any of us as we faithfully walk with him, follow him, and believe in him. That is why John highlights for us at the end of this sign and his disciples believed in him. And it's interesting to note how counterculture Jesus was. He took six jars that were used for washing and filled them with delicious wine. Jars that were used for washing their bodies were now used for drinking wine. He was turning these people's lives upside down. The second sign was the healing of the official son in John 4. This sign also takes place in Cana. A royal official has arrived. His son was sick in bed in Capernaum. The official heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea. So he went to Jesus and begged him to come and heal his son. The boy was close to death. Jesus told him, You people will never believe unless you see miraculous signs and wonders. The royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus replied, You may go. Your son will live. The man believed what Jesus said, and so he left. This royal official was a Jewish man. He had a powerful job and plenty of money, 
but he had no way to help his sick son. There was no Tylenol back then. There was no way to bring the fever down. The boy was about to die. And suddenly the desperate father heard that Jesus was visiting a few kilometers away. This Jewish official may have scoffed at the stories about Jesus before, but now he had a real need. His son's life was on the line. I can imagine him looking at his son wondering if he should leave his side. Will he die while I'm gone? But the father took the chance. He went to Jesus. He went as fast as he could to find the healer he had heard about. The official obeyed Jesus' word and returned home. And while he was still on his way home, his servants met him. They gave him the news that his boy was living. He asked what time his son got better. They said to him, the fever left him yesterday afternoon at 1 o'clock. Then the father realized what had happened. That was the exact time Jesus had said to him, your son will live. The official only wanted a healthy son, but Jesus had way more in store for him. Jesus wanted to heal the boy, to teach the official just how powerful his word was, to give the official and his family the opportunity to believe in him as a son of God and, and gain eternal life. So here Jesus does not only demonstrate his love and compassion by healing the boy, but also his power over time and space. The official son was 20 kilometers away and he was healed by Jesus' words, healed instantly. The result? So he and his whole household believed. Next we have the sign of the 5,000. The plot of this is simple. Thousands of people gathered in a remote place where Jesus was teaching and healing them. When it came time for the evening meal, there was nothing for the people to eat other than five loaves of bread and two fish that a young boy had. From these, however, Jesus was able to provide ample food for the whole crowd, a crowd of 5,000 men, plus many women and children. He miraculously multiplied the quantity of food so that everyone was well fed and there were 12 baskets of leftovers. Not unlike Jesus' healing miracles, his feeding of the crowd shows his compassion of men and their needs. Jesus cared for the people in their ordinary hunger and demonstrated loving hospitality. Yet like the healing, the miracle of feeding also demonstrated the presence of the kingdom of God. It echoed the fam familiar story of God providing manna for the children of Israel as they journeyed through the wilderness. And it began to fulfill Old Testament prophetic promises. This shine, sign shows the power of Jesus taking a little food and multiplying it enough to feed thousands of people. And this leads to the statement of Jesus being the bread of eternal life. And through the food, through the food that that young boy, it also demonstrates how Jesus uses others, people like you and me, in kingdom works. The next one was healing the blind, the man born blind. And I just want to point out a couple things here. As with the other signs, they end up with, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped them. All these signs are sufficient for us to understand who Jesus really was and to achieve the result of worshiping him. And it's worth noting the progression in this blind man's understanding of Jesus. The blind man first knows Jesus simply as a man. And then he speaks of Jesus as a prophet. Finally, he comes to believe in him as the Son of God. The final sign that John includes in his gospel is probably the most amazing of all. It demonstrates Jesus' authority and power over death itself. Here we have the amazing story of Jesus bringing Lazarus back to life. He's the brother of Mary and Martha, the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. They send word to Jesus that Lazarus is sick and to please come. But Jesus delays. And in the meantime, Lazarus dies. When Jesus does arrive, they both state that if he had been there, Lazarus would not have died. Now Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live. Even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? The reply was, 
yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into this world. Jesus was deeply moved in spirit and troubled over the sadness of the death of Lazarus, who has now been dead for four days. Now Jesus, he goes to the tomb, and he called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And he did. Jesus raised him from the dead. And how does it end? And many believed in him. Again, we see compassion, love, and absolute authority. Authority over life and death. If any sign was going to convince the people who he was, this definitely was the one. So what have these seven signs or miracles shown us of Jesus? Changing water into wine, compassion, love, power, and glory. Healing an official son, compassion, power, love, glory. Healing a lame man, compassion, love, power, and glory. Feeding the 5,000, compassion, love, power, and glory. Healing the man born blind, compassion, love, power, and glory. And rising, raising Lazarus from the dead, compassion, love, power, and glory. Jesus has compassion for all of us, wanting us to have a full and joyful life, not only in this world, but for all eternity. Jesus loves us and deeply cares for us. We are his creation. Jesus is omnipotent. There is no limit to his power over all creation, even death. And Jesus deserves all glory that can only be ascribed to God and to God alone. And these signs show us the all-encompassing knowledge of God. He knows exactly what we need. And each sign shows God's fellowship. He is a personal God. He interacted with all the people mentioned in these stories on a personal level. And these signs are not merely superhuman events, but events that demonstrate who God is. Almost every sign Jesus did was renewal of fallen creation, restoring sight, making the lame walk, even restoring life to the dead. Believe in Jesus not because he is a superman, but because he is God who has compassion and love for us. He continues his creation, even in those of us who are poor, weak, crippled, orphaned, blind, deaf, or some other desperate need. John begins his gospel by how God spoke and all creation came into being. And then he became flesh. The mighty creator became part of creation. He became a man. And it was glory and love that propelled him and so he came to rescue and save those who were lost and to give them a gift, the gift of eternity. He is the Word. He is Jesus, the Son of God. It is this truth that the Apostle John brings to us in this book. John's gospel is not a life, is not the life of Jesus. It is a powerful argument for the incarnation of God, a conclusive demonstration that Jesus was and is the very heaven-sent Son of God and the only source of eternal life. Jesus' identity is revealed at the very beginning of this book in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In John's Gospel, there is no middle ground. Either Jesus is truly the Son of God, or else John is crazy. Either John is supremely deluded and must be demissed as a fool, or his witness is true and Jesus is to be ascribed the honors due to God alone. There's no rational middle ground. God makes it clear that Jesus is not just a man. He is the eternal Son of God. He is the light of the world because he offers this gift of eternal life to all people. We need nothing more to believe in him. What John has put forth in these seven signs of Jesus is not only to convince us that Jesus is truly the Son of God, but what he has put forth is sufficient to convince us. And it is not just an intellectual exercise, as I mentioned, believing with our minds, but it is a thing of our hearts. We are to believe with our hearts. It is so powerful that it is to affect every aspect of our lives. Jesus is to rule our lives, and we should imitate him. Our neighbors should see God's glory in how we live. Our work colleagues should see God's glory in the way we work. The clerk at the grocery store should see God's light shining through us. 
all our words, deeds, and thoughts 24-7 should reflect God's glory. We can't be Christians only on Sunday morning. Jesus himself made many claims in John's gospel. Jesus claimed to be the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies, the Son of Man, the Son of God, the Messiah, Teacher, Master, Lord, Savior. We have no ch other choice but to agree or disagree with his claims. Eternal life is a choice, and John's purpose is to help us make the right choice. Plus, in this book of John's, Jesus g gave himself many names. Some refer to Old Testament promises. Others were ways to help people understand him. Son of man, bread of life, light of the world, gate for the sheep, good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth, and the life, the true vine. It's up to us to make the decision. Do we believe and accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, or do we remain in darkness? And Jesus realized that if people were going to follow him, and if his followers were going to be truly effective Christians in the world, they needed to know exactly who he was. And that's probably one of the reasons he asked this simple but all-important question in Mark 8. Tell me, he's talking to the apostles, tell me, he says, who do people say I am? And a couple of verses later, he refines the question. What about you? He asks him, who do you say I am? That is Jesus' question you must answer. Who do you say I am? So tonight when you're home, get that piece of paper out with your pen and write down your answer to this all-important question from Jesus. Who do you say I am? And don't do it just today, but do it often as you grow closer to Jesus, the Son of God. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your words, for the question you have put forth to us. Who do you say I am? May we know your son intimately so our, our answer results in worship and glory to you. Let us be the Christians you created us to be, humble servants who glorify you in all our words, thoughts, and deeds. We thank you for your gift of your son, the son of God, our Lord and Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. So now we'll continue in our praise of the Lord with our tithes and offerings. And let us offer to God the gratitude of our hearts for his unspeakable gift to us in Jesus Christ, our Savior, the Son of God. Let us come in worship, bringing the fruit of our labors with cheerful hearts, knowing that you are a gracious God and we are only stewards of all that you have entrusted to us. As you have given yourself for us, we give ourselves to you for Christ's sake. Thank you.
Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for blessing us with such giving hearts. We thank you for these gifts that we give to you now. We ask that your Holy Spirit guide us in using these gifts for the works of your kingdom, for meeting the needs of the many, and for the many ministries of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Let me read, leave you with a benediction from the book of Jude, verses 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and and forever. Amen. Go in peace. Your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table, Jesus, thank you.